Welcome to the Memories of a Moonbird podcast, exploring life one story at a time. Hello, friends. I'm Daniel Sherl. Today on the show, for over 50 years, he's worked in the entertainment business as a director, writer, and producer. He created iconic shows like the V miniseries and characters like Jamie Summers in the original Bionic Woman. He's also produced and directed The Incredible Hulk, Alien Nation, Short Circuit 2, Steel, and Jag. He's a graduate of Carnegie Mellon, a father of four, and a winner of multiple prestigious awards. And we share a friendship with Vanita Ozels Graham, who's been on the show before. Please welcome the amazing and brilliant Kenny Johnson. Kenny, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I am fine, Dan. Thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Any friend of Vanita Ozols Graham is a friend of mine. <laughs> ditto, ditto. So, Kenny, you were born in Arkansas, if I'm correct, yes? That's right, son. I was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. It's about 40 miles south of that good old all-American town, Little Rock. Nice. My, uh, my girlfriend's actually from a very small town in southern Missouri, about a half hour from the Arkansas border. Well, my grandfather came from Missouri, and uh, one of my grandfathers. And uh, uh, yeah, I was born in the same hospital that my mother and father were born in some years prior. Wow. Uh, it was a very sweet little small town. Uh, actually, it was the second largest town in Arkansas at the time, but uh, has since sort of gone to seed. I'm back there for about 10 minutes, and I just talk like this, Dan. <laughs> Now, what were you like as a child growing up in Arkansas? Oh, I didn't. I, that was the thing. I, I was uh, uh, in. I was about four years old when we moved to Washington D.C. It was the end of the uh, World War II. My father was uh, uh, on the general's uh, st general staff in uh, in the Pentagon, and uh, and so we moved there. And I, uh, we were first in Virginia, and then ultimately I ended up growing up in Maryland. Uh, outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, my mother and father were divorced when I was about seven, I guess. And uh, he went back to Arkansas uh, and raised a family there. And I would see him in the summers. But uh, I was raised really by my mother and stepfather uh, in um, in Maryland, outside of Washington. If you go out the front door of the White House and right down 16th Street for about 20 miles, uh, you get to where I grew up. And then it was it was like farm country. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Uh, now it's, of course, uh, just a sprawling uh, sub suburb, but it's a good, 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 good place to grow up. Yeah, I lived in Annapolis briefly for a time. It's a beautiful part of the country, Maryland. Yes, it is. It really is. Well, I'm curious, what experiences growing up made you want to work in entertainment? <laughs> when I was a kid, I, I thought I was going to be an electronics engineer because I had learned how to hook up stereo speakers in my room uh, at home. And that was my uh, idea of what electronics was all about. Uh, but uh, uh, my grades in math and science were not quite as strong as some of my others. And uh, uh, but more than that, I uh, I, I bought a, a I saw a tape recorder, a reel to reel tape recorder, uh, which in those days was the size of a suitcase and weighed about four thousand pounds. <laughs> uh, and I saved up my money and uh, bought a tape recorder. At the same time, I had uh, come across a uh, copy of the script that uh, Howard Koch had written for War of the Worlds. Mm. Uh, and I said, oh, this is cool. It's a radio play. I could do a radio play with my tape recorder. <laughs> and so I got some of my uh, ninth grade friends together uh, and uh, and we did uh, War of the Worlds. And it um, uh, it was it was a huge amount of fun, and I when I was finished, um, I played it for one of my uh, teachers at uh, at school, and she just went crazy for it. She said, "This is great! What you what you've accomplished here!" And but anyway, so I, I got uh, sort of interested in in, um, in I became known as the drama guy. So that by the tenth grade, they were going to do a production <clears throat> at um, uh, at the Christmas program that the school did every year. Uh, they were going to do a production of Scrooge of a, of a Christmas Carol. And they asked me if I would play Scrooge. And I said, yeah, sure, that'd be fun. Mm. Uh, and and we, it was a sort of the standard version of A Christmas Carol, sort of simplistic, and it ended like the way they always do. And and it just sort of fizzled out at the end. And I, I went to the drama coach and I, I said, you know, I think I got an idea. I heard a recording of, uh, I think it might have been Noel Coward, who did a, a, uh, a an LP recording of A Christmas Carol. And at the end of it, he did a little speech where he sort of summarized the whole thing and pulled it all together. And I, I said, may I do that at the end of the, can I just step out in front of the curtain at the end and and do this little uh, soliloquy? Hmm. And uh, and she said, oh, that would, that would be lovely. Yeah, she liked it. And then I got to thinking, 
it needs a little music though, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> so I went to the choral department because the, the 60 voice chorus was going to be singing at the, uh, Hollywood, at the Christmas show. Uh, the music uh, teacher uh, said, I told her what I wanted to do. And, and we decided that uh, Oh Holy Night would be good. I said, but here's what, have them start singing when the curtain closes. Don't have them sing the words, just go do, 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 you know, very soft. And I will come out and I will do my little, my little speech and then have them sing the words when you get to this point in the score. And so, so we did our play and uh, the curtains closed and I stepped out on the stage and this was in an old gymnasium, not some fancy mm. theater. I had a blue spotlight on me on the, on the, on the stage. It was snowing outside, Dan. I mean, really. So beautiful. And, uh, and they start going do, 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 do. And I say, well, that was a Christmas for you. And I may tell you that Tiny Tim did not die. He's alive and growing stronger day by day. Fine boy. I'll, I'll see him tonight at dinner for I keep Christmas now. And so, <laughs> the, so now every Christmas when I'm in an elevator and Oh Holy Night starts it up, I start doing my speech, right? <laughs> well, I know every word of it. And I get to the end. I timed it so that just as I got to the end and said, and so as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us everyone. And at that moment, the 60 voice chorus goes, fall on your knees, oh here. That was electrifying, Dan. And I <laughs> was amazing. backstage and I was leaning against the wall backstage and my little heart was going pity pat. And I realized I have found my home. I need to be in the theater. And you were directing even back then. Yeah, you was. You see, when you look back, that's what I was doing. I was producing. I was. I needed a little music. I needed, sound, you know. And so I was a producer, writer, director in the 10th grade doing that. And then I went on to do the, the lead in the junior class play and in the senior class play and studied uh, Shakespeare uh, during while I was still in high school. I studied Shakespeare at uh, the Catholic University Drama Department, which was then one of the three or four premier drama schools in the country. Um, and uh, and when I graduated, I went to what was then Carnegie Tech. I want to ask you about that, actually, because you went to Carnegie Tech before it was Carnegie Mellon. And That's I'm right. Curious... I, I still have difficulty with Carne Carnegie Mellon sounds like something you order with prosciutto. <laughs> I'll leave the Carnegie Mellon, please. Well, what were you like in college? Were you were you a nerdy kid? Were you a cool kid? No. Well, you know, I was a theater kid. And uh, the thing about Carnegie, about the drama department at Carnegie Tech, which incidentally was also one of the top three drama schools in the country, there was no film. There was no TV or anything like that taught. It was strictly theater. And uh, they'd look down their nose and oh my goodness, films. And then television, they would just hold their noses, you know, please. Mm. But the directing majors had to take everybody's classes. It was a really uh. killer option. But uh, I figured that way, at least I would come out knowing a little bit about everything, uh, which I felt that it was really important to do because I didn't know where I was going to end up. Well, and that's much like the conductor of an orchestra that has to know a little bit about every instrument. Exactly. You know? It's important to, to, to note that, um, as I said, Carnegie was only, uh, was only theater. And however, I was very lucky because uh, the first week of my freshman year, I met a guy who was a senior. Um, his name was Bill Pence. And uh, and he built it turned out was a big man on campus. He ran the school newspaper. He ran several others of the, of the major uh, extracurricular activities at Carnegie, including the Film Arts Society, where every Thursday he had uh, three screenings of a classic film. And uh, and I got involved helping him sell tickets for it. I mean, for three dollars, you got to see fourteen of the greatest films ever made. Wow. I had always been a, a, a you know a, I loved I was a movie fan, but it was Bill that really introduced me to the cinema. And uh, and when Bill graduated that uh, next year, uh, as I was finishing my freshman year, he just assumed uh, that I was going to take over the film society. And I said, Bill, I don't know enough about film to do that. And he said, oh, come on, Kenny. If I said intolerance, wouldn't you know? I said, Bill, if you said intolerance, I'd think about my mother, you know, <laughs> so because she was one of the most in intolerant people I ever knew. Um, but I said, but I'm listen, I'm willing to learn. And so I took over and I ran the film society. And uh, so by the time I got out of Carnegie, I'd had not only the theater training on the one hand, but a, a kind of a cinema tech training like Godard and Truffaut were getting in the Paris cinema tech. Mm. And um, uh, Bill, incidentally, went on to create the Telluride Film Festival. Oh, how cool. So it was great. He was kind of, I think of him as the godfather of my motion picture career. 
Well, since you brought it up, I wanted to ask you, growing up, you said with an intolerant mother, how did that actually inform who you are today? Because you seem like a very tolerant person, obviously, and you work in a business that is by its very nature diverse and tolerant. Uh, sometimes it is, <laughs> and, uh, often not enough. Agreed. Uh, it, had a, it, had a, it had a huge impact because my mother and stepfather were both terribly bigoted, virulently anti-Semitic. Uh, and there was not a night at my dinner table, and it was just me, I was an only child. Um, uh, there was not a night at our dinner table that went by without hearing one sort of racial slur or uh, put down of other people. Mm. It was interesting because my stepfather was an Irish Catholic guy from, from New England, and he was a bigger bigot about black people and definitely about Jewish people than even than my mother was, although they both were pretty heavy handed about it. Wow. it. What's weird, though, is that for some reason it never stuck, Dan. Uh, I just didn't buy it. Uh, I had friends that were that were Jewish, that were black, that and, and it, it was not like I just didn't see it. I didn't understand it. And I I sort of it really. It, infuriated me and annoyed me. And, uh, and I, you know, I, one of my favorite lines in the theater is what Oscar Hammerstein wrote and won the Pulitzer Prize for in South Pacific about you've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. Mm. Whenever I hear that piece of music, I wonder why I just knew better. It's pretty incredible, actually. Yeah, and it was, and then my my father, uh, living who lived in Arkansas and whom I saw in the summers only, was brilliant. He was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate in electrical engineering. Oddly enough, I never knew anybody in my life that had a more astonishing mind or memory than my father until I met Nixon. Nixon was had that ability too. Hmm. Nixon could meet you one time and 20 years later run into you and go, hey, Dan, how, you know, how are you? And you're still doing the show? And, you know, and, and, remember, wow. and my father was that way too. But my father had grown up on a plantation outside of Pine Bluff uh, with three brothers who were also equally gifted and bright, but who all who completely believed that the black race was inferior to the white race. And this is, you know, and I would have these arguments with my dad, who was, as I said, you know, a Phi Beta Kappa graduate. I mean, he was an ace. And yet he couldn't. He said, well, no, you know, their blood's no good. Uh, I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, they have that sickle cell anemia stuff. It's it's not it's not good blood. It's It's been proven. It's all scientifically proven, you know, and it was like, whoa, OK. And I listen, I. I struggled through my entire uh, life with Hit Daddy, trying to uh, get him to. Um, and he was he was not ingracious, though. He wasn't nasty or I, I never in my life saw him be anything other than genuinely friendly and kind to people who, of color. Uh, and uh, but in my mother and stepfather were not that way. They were just like. Ew. Well, I was going to ask you before they died, did they ever reach a point of understanding or was it that way till their death? Nope. Nope. All the way through. Uh, well, let's talk about your time after Carnegie when your career started. And I know you, you, I know you did the Mike Douglas show. And was that your first big professional job in entertainment? <laughs> well, I, uh, I was determined to make movies. That's what I wanted to make. And, um, uh, when I was still at Carnegie, um, I decided after running the Film Society for three years that I could bullshit about movies all the time, but I really needed to get a camera in my hands and make a movie, but there was no equipment and there was no film. There was nothing. And so I called Bill Pence, my friend, who was then um, uh, in the Air Force doing his time, but he was running a film division at an Air Force base. And he said, what do you need? And I said, I need a camera and film. And he, he sent me one of the Air Force cameras and, uh, oh, wow. and all the film I needed so that I could go out and, and make this little 30-minute uh, uh, thriller that I filmed in the old Fine Arts Building at Carnegie, which is this magnificent castle-like place that's very creepy at night. Did you get actors? from the school to participate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of actor friends of mine and a couple of the teachers actually got involved as well. Anyway, the bottom line was I ended up with a, uh, a about a half an hour piece of film, kind of noirish that uh, I thought could help me get to connect it. And uh, I went to New York and said, here I am ready to make movies. And they said, why did you come to New York? We're, in, <laughs> we're not making that many movies here. <laughs> uh, and by then I was already married with a child. Um, so I had to uh, uh, keep digging and ended up at a, uh, in, with a job in television 
television. Uh, I got hired uh, by one of the local, big local stations in New York, WPIX. Uh, the manager there saw my film that I had made and he said, okay, well, there's some film work that I can give you while you're here, but I really need you to produce and, and direct uh, this. Uh, we got a rock and roll show that needs a breath of fresh air. And so I was 20. Two, I guess by then, and uh, and I joined WPIX as a producer director and uh, you know the youngest person at the station, um, and uh, we had a couple of hit shows that did really well, and I did some documentary stuff also while I was there. Uh, I spent the summer at KYW, which was the NBC station in Cleveland, uh, where they were doing this local show called the My yeah. Douglas Show. Now I, I got there and I was, a, I, they said, okay, you're going to start as a PA on the Douglas Show. I said, what's the Douglas Show? Nobody outside of Cleveland had heard of it. Well, I'm actually from Cleveland. I was born in 71, but I knew about the Mike Douglas Show just right. because it began, I knew it began in Cleveland. So it's just funny that you worked on it. That's yeah. right. It started in Cleveland. Well, West, Westinghouse was very smart. They realized there was an opportunity to do a daytime talk variety music show, 90 minutes a day. Uh, and uh, and nobody had done that yet, uh, but they didn't want to just jump right in. They wanted to try it out. So Cleveland was like uh, a Boston out of town tryout for a Broadway show. And they they worked the show in Cleveland for about a year and a half. And then it started into syndication. And so I was in in. Uh, when I first worked on the Douglas show, it was in Cleveland. Uh, so I, when I graduated, they offered me a job, but I wanted to go to New York and I didn't want to do TV and I wanted, you know, there you go. Yeah. But uh, they stayed in touch with me. And um, while I was at PIX uh, doing pretty well, I, uh, I got a call from Westinghouse asking if I would meet with this young executive producer. The Mike Douglas show had now moved to Philadelphia, was now nationally syndicated, was in about 150 markets or so. Uh, and it was a big, big show. It was the only daytime talk show. And so everybody in the world came through there. Uh, but I didn't want to do it. And I said, just go meet this guy. He's a young guy. He's like you. He likes your work. He likes what he's seen. So I go over to the Warwick Hotel in New York City and I sit down with Roger Ailes. And this is Roger Ailes from Fox? This is Roger Ailes who became the Roger Ailes at Fox. Yes. But a lot, this is long before he turned into sort of that Orson Welles, Orson Welles, Job of the Hut, uh, Roger Ailes. <laughs> now, he was a young, scrappy guy like me. And uh, and he said, look, I said, Roger, I, thanks. He wanted me to come and be a producer with him at the Douglas Show. I said, no, I don't want to do a 90 minutes a day live television. I want to make films. He said, oh, I'll, make, let you, I'll let you make all the films you want. I'm, I'm looking anxious to do. He's, Roger was a great salesman, right? And, um, uh, and so I... I said, okay, I'll take the shot. And so I, I left New York and uh, moved. My my second child had just been born, Juliet. And it was in 66. And I went to the, to Philadelphia and joined Roger at the Douglas Show. And, um, and I have to tell you that uh, I know he went through some real bad stuff uh, later on that nobody would be proud of or, or being associated with. Yeah. But that was not the Roger that I knew. The only person I ever saw Roger hit on was Richard Nixon. And, <laughs> and I'm not kidding, because uh, Nixon came to do the show. Everybody in the world came to do the show. All the authors, uh, actors, stars, singers, musicians, novelists, you know, everybody. Uh, and Nixon came in 68 uh, while he was campaigning for president. And Roger grabbed him after the show and pulled him into his office and said, um, uh, Mr. Nixon, I can get you elected. And, and Nixon said, well, how can you do that, Roger? And <laughs> Roger said, because you need a media advisor. Well, what's a media advisor, Roger? And, and Roger said, I am. And he convinced Nixon that he could produce Nixon the same way that he produced Mike. And Roger went off to produce Nixon and, um, and told Westinghouse that I should be the one that took over the Douglas show as executive producer. I was 24. Five maybe at that point, Dan, and uh, uh, and 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 I and I said, but I don't want to be here. I, want to, I, was, I had already had one foot out the door. I was going to go to Hollywood, uh, but I decided to stay and take the big credit and take the uh, and I say I said, okay, look, I'll stay for one more season and then I'll go to the West Coast. Um, and I was so there. I was the youngest writer producer, the youngest producer uh, of an executive producer of a major national show in the industry. And uh, after about eight, 10 months, uh, I, I said, OK, I've had enough. Um, so I said, uh, thanks very much, guys. And I came out to California and said, here I am ready to make movies. And Hollywood said, 
you're a talk show producer. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, and I realized, <laughs> oh my God, you know, you get, you get typecast. I, I was the, uh, I was the drama guy. And then I was the, uh, you know, the, the talk show guy. And here I was in California and I was sleeping on the, on the couch of, uh, of my dear friend, Steve Bochco, who had been with me at Carnegie and he had gotten out to California before I had and had gotten his toe in the door at Universal Studios as a fledgling writer. This was long before Steve created Hill Street Blues or anything else. Doogie Howser and NYPD Blue and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, he was just a young writer at uh, at Universal. Uh, but he got my foot in the door at Universal. Uh, but he said, you know, Kenny, it'll be easier if you write. Uh, and I said, what are you talking about? I hate writing. I'm no good at writing. And I'm a director. That's what I do best. And he said, no, you can write. And I said, no, I can't. <laughs> he said, you took the same class as I did. And yeah, you know, so he, <laughs> he I literally dragged me kicking and screaming into writing because he convinced me that if you're an actor, you can do bit parts and work your way up. If you're a writer, you can write on spec because nobody has to pay you to sit down and write. But if you're a director, they either give you the money to do the direct something or they don't. And they don't usually do that until you've done it for somebody else. So how do you do it? You know, it's like hmm. you can't get there from here. But so Steve convinced me to try to write. And uh, and I discovered that I actually could write and could write pretty fast. And I became a prolific writer of unproduced screenplays, Dan, most of them <laughs> still on my shelf. But one of them uh, uh, really uh, was was pretty good, and Steve liked it a lot. And by then, he had introduced me to um, Steve Cannell, who was also a young writer at Universal at the time. Also super famous. Well, not then. <laughs> he was a story editor on Adam 12 at the time. But I, I still remember the day that Steve Cannell gave me this script uh, for a pilot that he'd just written to see what I thought of it, and it was The Rockford Files. Oh, great show. Yeah, well, boom, and he suddenly became Steve Cannell. And uh, uh, and the two of them had really helped get me a couple of small gigs at Universal. Steve Cannell got me a couple of directing gigs on, uh, on Adam 12, this cop show. Uh, so I really sort of finally got my foot into, into filmmaking there. But the big move was when uh, Steve Bochco introduced me to Harv Bennett, who was a uh, one of the big executive producers on the lot? He had done a number of big miniseries like Rich Man, Poor Man, and that thing, that sort of thing. And he had this new show that was on, uh, had just come on, called The Six Million Dollar Man. Well, I just have to interject real quick. Um, Harv Bennett also, you know, did Star Trek, the motion picture, Ooh. and uh, and Star Trek Three, I believe, right? Yeah. Later on, uh, uh, Harv segued out of TV and into the Star Trek movies. Uh, but at this time, he was just doing TV and. And they had this show on the air with six mil and they uh, and they didn't have any scripts and they were desperate. And uh, and he read this uh, this one particular script that I'd written, which he really loved. He said, I can't help you make this movie, but I like your writing. What would you give me some ideas for a six million dollar man? And I said, how about the Bride of Frankenstein? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you've got this man that is sort of um, monsterish. He's got these monster legs that makes him run fast and his powerful arm and all that. Shouldn't there be a bride of Frankenstein? Shouldn't there be a, a bionic woman? Uh. And, uh, and Harv loved that idea. Uh, and asked me to to write it, and so uh, so I did. And we went through a couple of drafts in a hurry, and uh, um, finally I delivered a, the screenplay that they um, that they really liked. But Harv called me and said, "Listen, we really love this script, but it's too dense." And I said, "I know, I know. I told you. I kept telling him, you got us. We can't pack all the things into it that you want. It's really a love story. It's a personal story. Not all this mission, mission gosh, you know." <laughs> and um, uh, and I said, "What do you tell me? What you want me to cut?" And Harv said, "No, no, no. You don't understand. We don't want you to cut it. We want you to make it longer." I said, "But Harv, you only have a one-hour show." And he said, "No, we're going to have the first two-part show." Oh. Uh, suddenly, I was uh, uh, Harv really took me under his wing, asked me to join the Six Million Dollar Man as a producer, writer, and I said, "Harv, you know what? Let me just write and direct for you. Producing is such a pain in the ass. I'd much rather just write and direct." And and Harv said, "Kenny, let me." Let me explain to you how television works. In television, it's the producer that hires the writer and the producer that hires the director. I said, I understand what you're saying, Harv, and I will take that job. <laughs> uh, so that I did, and I proceeded to hire myself to write and direct, uh, finally. And, well, uh, and Kenny, you're, you're obviously, you're so well known for The Bionic Woman and Alien Nation and The Incredible Hulk and, of course, V. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just curious of all those amazing projects. Do you have a favorite? Well, it's interesting. I have two. It's hard because they're, you know, which of your children do you like better, Dan? You know, sure. sure. Uh, and, uh, but no, there are, there are absolutely, I mean, there are standouts. Certainly the bionic woman was a groundbreaking piece of work because there had not really been a female lead in a show like that um, and uh, and became a uh, and that could become an archetype and a role model for young women uh, and it's Lindsay and I had lunch a couple of about a year ago we were she brought it up she said you do you realize what we did <laughs> you know and it was and and she sees it of course much more than I do because she's so visible and people recognize and are always telling her how she shaped their childhood and how what we did together and um uh, so from the, from from one standpoint, I mean that was the the the, the one that first got broke the ice for me, but um, the uh, uh, certainly the, and certainly the Incredible Hulk was not something I ever aspired to. I didn't want to get involved with comic book characters, and I didn't like spandex and primary colors. Uh, and they offered me after the success of Bionic Woman. Uh, they offered me uh, my my pick of uh, five other mar five Marvel comic shows, none of which I wanted to do. Mm. Uh, but my wife Susie had given me a, a copy of Les Miserables to read, which I had never read, and so I had Jean Valjean and Victor Hugo in my head and uh, uh, the fugitive concept. And uh, and I realized, oh my God, I could take this ludicrous thing called the Incredible Hulk and turn it into uh, an adult psychological drama. Uh, if they let me, if they leave me alone. So that's how that happened. And so this- And which way, real quick pride. side note about The Incredible Hulk, I think it actually still to this day has one of the most beautiful musical themes. <laughs> yes, you're right. Joe Harnell's theme. I said, Joe, you know, I want a lonely man haunting theme that will run through the whole show. And I still remember sitting at the piano with him and 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 because uh, he had written something that was really beautiful. And I, I would drive him crazy. Joe always used to say, I knew just enough about music to be dangerous. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I, I remember sitting on his piano bench and listening to the, the, him, the, the melody that he'd written. And I said, this is really great what if we change this one note here and we did and suddenly we looked at each other and went whoa that's i don't know whether we took it into a minor key or something but it was uh it was amazing and you're right it, it's a big it's become an iconic piece of music that uh have you ever seen the stuff on the family guy that they the send-ups that they have done yeah yeah it's great you know it's it's great stuff but so I, so it, it was it gave me a lot of pride for to, to do that and we had a wonderful relationship Bix, bixby and i did through the whole five years that we did the show and it allowed us to talk about a lot of things that were that were not that were unexpected for that kind of a show uh, and Marriott Hartley came on and won an Emmy for one of the, the, the two hour uh, epics that I wrote and directed. Uh, and so there's pride there. But, you know, to, to go back to your original question, what are, what are the ones that I, I, I love the most? Uh, I'm proudest probably of V because it came completely out of my little pea brain. Uh, it was not uh, an offshoot like the Bionic Woman was or uh, didn't have any other origins like the Incredible Hulk did. It was purely out of my head. And, um, and because of that, and because of what we accomplished with it, and, uh, and the, it has, it's become probably the most iconic of all of my, my pieces. Well, I'm going to jump in here real quick and ask you, as the man who has written and created the entire V miniseries, have you noticed some of the parallels today between the <laughs> politics and <laughs> situations in that no, show? No, really, Dan? I mean, no, it's, no. it's pretty incredible. You mean like the whole takeover of the media by uh, <laughs> yes, yes. The fascist side of, yes. And uh, oh, yeah, no, it's well, we're in the process. Uh, I mean, I discovered a few years ago that I own the motion picture rights Ooh. and uh, we have been endeavoring to set up, as Vanita maybe told you, uh, to set up V as a, as a motion picture trilogy. Uh, the first movie will be a, a really faithful remake uh, of the original miniseries, not a reimagining as <laughs> you know what happens when people try to reimagine things. Yeah. Even the real creator, even the original creators, you know, it's your you it's your you move at your own peril. Um because uh, the people who have tried to reimagine the Bionic Woman and reimagine the Incredible Hulk, uh, you know, they were just disastrous. Uh, the first two Hulk movies, even directed by Ang Lee, which was uh, you know, it was like 
wow, it was just awful. Well, they and, lost the heart and soul of, of what you guys originally put into well, it. That's you it. Know? That's it. You put your finger on it. In both cases, the heart and soul uh, was missing from the bionic woman reimagining uh, the, the and the humor and the humanity. Uh, and likewise, the same thing in, in the in the Hulk movies. And and they've also tried to reimagine V a couple of times, again, with disastrous <laughs> results both times. Yeah. So our game plan is to do a, uh, the first of the trilogy would be a remake of the original miniseries and really faithful because I don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's no reason to fix things that aren't broken. Agreed. But it, I've certainly obviously updated it into the 21st century. And then the two sequels, that would form the other part of the trilogy come from the novel that I wrote, V, The Second Generation, which picks up the story 20 years later. And if I recall, this is about the signal they sent into space looking for the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Exactly, yeah. exactly. What happens? And so we pick up and we see what's become of the world. And it's not a dystopia on the surface. It looks pretty good on the surface. Yeah, there are people that go missing a lot. And gee, they're taking a third of the water off the planet. But it's like planetary dialysis. We're cleansing it and we're going to bring it all back and Earth is going to be better, faster, stronger, you know. <laughs> so it's uh, it really is a, a, a three movie ride. And that's what we're endeavoring to try to, to get set up. So so I'm really, uh, V is really my legacy piece, but the show that I that I had the most fun doing was Alien Nation. Uh, Paris Cattleman was an old friend from game shows, actually, who rose up to where he was running uh, television at Fox. And he called me and said, look, we had a movie that we just did. It didn't do very well, but there might be a premise in it that you could do something with as a series. And he said it was Alien Nation. And I said, no, 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 uh, no, no. No more alien stuff. I don't want to do that, you know. <laughs> and he said, "Well, just take a look at the movie." And and so I I was sitting at it, and and you know, and I love Mandy Patinkin, and I and I love Jimmy Kahn, but and the premise was really intriguing, but it sort of just felt like Miami Vice with cone heads is how I've described it. <laughs> they they just had this great premise, and they were kind of it just didn't come together. And then I was, and I was sitting alone in the screening room at Fox, looking at it, and then this one scene came up where Mandy, the alien guy, waves goodbye to his wife and kids as he's leaving for work that morning. And I, there was one shot of them in the movie, and that's all. And I, But I looked at them, and the bell went off, and I said, wait a minute. Who are they? What's it like to be them? What's it like to be Vietnamese in Galveston, Texas in 1975, or Black in Chicago in 1950, or now, for that matter, you know? Uh, and I went back to Fox, the execs, and I said, okay, you think you've got lethal weapon with aliens, right? Yeah, yeah, they said. And I said, no, if you let me do something like In the Heat of the Night, which is about prejudice and discrimination and intolerance, yeah. I said, that's something that can really have legs and really last and really say something to the society. Um and uh, uh, and they sort of said, oh, OK, Kenny, uh, OK, sure, if that's what you want to do. <laughs> you know? So so that's what we did. And um, uh, and we ended up you know, doing it for almost seven years. Well, I have to say, you got to work with Gary Graham and Eric Pierpoint, who are actually two actors I really, really love and admire. I think they're brilliant. They, um, they are you know. amazing. Eric, I had met on a short lived series called Hot Pursuit. I, I, uh, I had already cast Carrie and I was still trying to find a, the right actor to play opposite her, her husband. And uh, uh, and I read a number of guys, but uh, uh, Eric came in. And when I was casting the, the women, I always read with the actor myself. Um, and just because I've discovered I can really get a sense of if they're listening to me and how they will respond to direction. And, uh, uh, and also having had a little acting training, I can really give them something to play off of. Whereas a lot of casting directors don't have those acting chops, which is why they became casting directors. So now there's Carrie, my actress, <laughs> Carrie Keene. And, and Eric comes in and reads with her and he's reading the same scene that I have been reading for, you know, with all these, you know, for, for weeks now. And Eric's getting laughs where I never got laughs. Mm. I said, wow, wait a minute. He's too good. You know, he's getting laughs where I couldn't get laughs. I better hire this guy. And when I sold the pilot for Alien Nation, the first call I made was to Eric and said, hey, look, I got a part for you. And I sent him the script and he wrote me, called me back. He said, oh, this is great. I think the human cop is really great. I think I'd really, and I said, no, 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 Eric, you're the alien. And Eric said, oh, I better go back and look at it again. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and actually, I don't know if you've seen it, Dan, but on the DVD release we did of the of the Alien Nation movies, um, there's a family gathering special feature where I just got the whole cast to come and sit in my living room and reminisce. And it's just great because you can really hear all the inside stories about how well we worked at it and how much how much fun we had, how we were always laughing. And and at the same time, we were doing a show that really had some bite and some some depth that uh, that you know really made people think. And so the, so that's the one that I had the most fun on. V, I, I'm the most proud of, just as I said, because it came completely out of my head, and uh, uh, and because it was as thought provoking then uh, as it as it is as it continues to be. Yeah. And uh, and it's just amazing the uh, the. The connection that I have had to the fans over the years, um, and not only uh, in person at, at the con- some of the cons at Comic Con and others, but um, but via email where I, I write back to them and back and I and I hear what they loved and all. So it's uh, uh, that's part of the reason I when I discovered I had the movie rights to V, I, I suddenly had a lot of new best friends, Dan, at all the studios. They all <laughs> wanted to buy it, buy the rights for a obscene amount of money. Uh, and, uh, and, and yes, I could produce, they, they might let me write, but for a director, maybe they're thinking like Michael Bay. And I said, you know, no, <laughs> I don't think so. Good for you. And Susie, my wife really put it into, uh, into focus for me when she said, all you have to do is ask yourself this one question. Would you rather the movie never got made than got made wrong by the wrong people? And I said, Susie, that's it. Well, I want to ask you, because you mentioned this briefly, um, for other people that are actually aspiring to do what you've done and produce, direct, and write, Mm -hmm. I have a two-part question for you. One, uh, what would you say is your piece of advice to other people who want to do things like you've done? And two, I'm really curious from all of your experience, what is the most important aspect of storytelling for you? Okay, well, to start with, about 18 years ago, I created a filmmaking seminar for UCLA. And the first thing I ask students is, do you love this business? And usually they'll nod and go, yeah, yeah. uh And I say, no, you're not understanding me. Do you love this business? Do you love it so much that you feel like you're underwater if you're not doing it? Like you can't breathe unless you're doing it. Mm. Do you love it that much? Because if you don't, then I really recommend you try a different major, you know, because there are 10 people behind you who do love it that much. So you've got to be really sure that it's really what you love uh, because otherwise you won't survive. You won't survive the enormous amounts of rejection that you get and crippling depression. And yeah, yes. oh, it's 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 yeah. You've got to you've got so that's that's really vital. So first you got to be sure you really love it. Then you've got to look to what your talents are. I think studying is is vital. I think it's it's really important to um, be as as deeply uh, literate as you possibly can be to read a lot uh, as I have done and uh, of, of all kinds of material. And as a director, you know, you've, you're, you've always got your eyes open. You're always thinking as a director, my daughter, Julie <clears throat> went to the film school at NYU and uh, I used to go back and visit her. And occasionally we'd, we'd take a walk together. And I remember one night we were walking through Times Square at, right at the theater time, you know, and Julie looked around and said, wow, dad, look at all the extras. <laughs> you know, and that's, and that's how you look at the world if you're a filmmaker, you know. So then what would you say is the most important aspect of storytelling for you? Um, if, you had, if you had to whittle it down. I don't know. To me, it, it. I never thought of it quite like that. I think of. I think of it as. I, I'm always looking for what I would like to see myself. Uh, when I when I come across an idea, when I when I read Sinclair Lewis's novel, it can't happen here. It, it was written in 1935 uh, about uh, the rise of fascism happening in America, like it had happened in uh, Hitler in, in Germany and Italy at the time, and the last four years in the United States. Yes. Well, how often has that book title come up in the last four years? You know, yeah. exactly that. But when I read that novel, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be interesting to examine what it would be like if suddenly there was a sea change in American life. Suddenly we were not in the same country anymore. 
And we had, at that time in 1982, there had not been a sea change in American life since December 7th, 1941, yeah. when Pearl Harbor was attacked. That was a sea change, and suddenly we were in a different country. Now, fortunately, it was a good country where everybody pulled together and we went for it, you know. Um, and then the next one wasn't until 9-11, uh, when we had the second time that we had that sort of amazing moment together. Um, but I, I, I was curious the way that that um, the way that V was never about uh, uh, spaceships and real lizards and all of that sort of thing. As, as you may know, it originally started as a piece about a grassroots rise in fascism uh, suddenly turn, take, taking over the country where suddenly we were in a different country. And um, my friend Brandon Tartikoff read the script. Uh, it was a movie script that I'd written. And he said, God, Kenny, this would be a great miniseries. And uh, uh, and I said, no, I, I, that's a movie, I think. And he said, no, it could be a great. He just was really he wouldn't let go of it. Uh, but he was concerned that uh, that Americans wouldn't get fascism and, and that sort of thing. And uh, and I and then I, he was a free thing. I thought we needed an outside force like the Soviets or the Chinese. I didn't buy that, and uh, but uh, the guy, the, the young guy who was sitting in the corner of the room, a young vice president named Jeff Sagansky, um, uh, said, "How about aliens, Kenny?" And I wanted to strangle him. Damn, you know. <laughs> I said, "No." <laughs> but but uh, but they said, "Well, just think about it. Just think about it." And I went home and I thought about it, and I thought it's a brilliant idea. Yeah, it's a brilliant idea because because I can tell the story that I want to tell, which was how do people react to power. Uh, I think that's the key maybe that you're looking for, Dan, is what's what's the what's it about when when writers would come to me to write episodes of Bionic Woman or Six Million Dollar Man or or Alien Nation even, um, you know, they they wouldn't they start to tell me plot. And I'd say, no, no, I don't want to know about plot. I want to know what is it about? Yeah. You know, is, it, is it about greed? Is it about obsession? Is it about power? Uh, what's it about? And uh, because V was about power, about how ordinary people respond to power, how some will suck up to it like the Vichy French did in World War II, sucked up to the Nazis, or uh, others will just keep their head down, hoping that uh, if I keep my, my head down and don't bother them, they won't bother me. And then there are the people who say, no, wait a minute, this power is being abused and we have to fight back against it. And they become the heroes of the resistance as they did in V. And uh, uh, and that's the story that I wanted to tell. And I realized I could tell that story without losing any of the, the, the emotional impact of it. And I think that's part of the key that I'm always looking for, too. Or well, I also think that's that's why the show has been such a success and still is relevant to this day. It's brilliant writing. You know, it's a timeless story. Well, that's it. Because, it, it, you know, it really, uh, I think, you know, I often have said it's like it's like Spartacus and the revolt of the slaves. It's a timeless story. It's the American Revolution. It's, you know, and uh, uh, it's apartheid. Um, and one of the things I've done in the, in the movie version, actually, uh, is to move it up a, a couple of generations. And uh, instead of a, a uh, the scientists, you know, of course, represent the Jews uh, in, in World War II uh, as the, the scapegoats. Uh, and there is the Holocaust survivor in V, of course, who helps to bring the relevance into the story. Yeah. But I moved it up and made it where the grandfather is uh, a black man who suffered through apartheid and lost his wife to apartheid. Mm. So it's a, it's 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 still the same story, though, as you say, it's timeless for sure. And uh, I get to ask you a question. I'm so curious to hear your answer, but just because it's so fun. What's your favorite prop that you've kept from all the projects you've worked on? <laughs> it's funny, but you know, one of, one of the things that I have is the crystal key that Donovan used to open the way into the belly of the beast uh -huh. uh, that got him into the innards of the mothership where he discovered the water and the bodies and, and all of it. And I have the crystal key and I keep it close by. <laughs> and uh, uh, But the other thing that I have kept, uh, which is important, is that um, uh, when I was doing the, early on the Bionic shows and then the Hulk and then V, my production designer was a guy named Chuck Davis. Uh, I would uh, take him onto a set uh, that I would, you know, I, or a location and I would show him a, a location and I'd say, okay, this is where we're going to shoot this, Chuck. And Chuck would look around and go, okay, is this the best we can do? And I'd be stuck and I'd go, well, I, uh, well, well, there's another thing over here we could look at. Okay, let's go look at it. And we go over, yeah, you're, you know, you're right, Chuck. This is better over here. So, okay. 
Is this the best we can do? And this would go on, Dan, until finally I would jump up and down and say, yes, this is the best we can do. And, uh, and Chuck said, all right, okay, that's all I want to know. I just want to know that it's the best we can do mm. before I put my heart and soul into it. And, uh, uh, and I lost Chuck uh, many, many years ago. He had a heart attack and I lost him, but I went, he was in the middle of designing a uh, scenes for me for a, a movie. And I went to his, uh, his desk uh, at the art department at MGM. And I picked up this, I'm looking at them right now, the eraser and the pencil that he had used the night before he died. Oh, and there's oh. a little glass case on my desk here, which always reminds me to be sure I am doing the best I can do. Yeah, it's a philosophy I believe in as well. And what a wonderful memento of your friend. That's awesome. Uh, Kenny, before we start to close out the show, I wanted to ask you, as an artist yourself, obviously, who spent so much of his life working in art, uh, what do you think is the purpose of art? I think it, it's, 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 uh, I have a quote from Stanislavski that I use in the class, and I can't remember it exactly off the top of my head, but the basic essence of it is uh, you have to be mindful, you have to love what you do, uh, because it gives you the opportunity to display on the stage or on the screen ideas that are important to get through to your audience that will that will make them think, that will dig into their souls, and that will make them better, finer, wiser members of society. And that's really key, I think, to everything. Agreed and well said. Well, Kenny, the last thing we do on the show is a little game I have called 299 Philosophical and Life Questions with Moonbird. I have 299 questions here I've collected from friends, family, and the internet. You get to pick two numbers from 1 to 299, and I'll speedily ask you those questions before we head off into the sunset. So okay. what are your two numbers? Um, uh, eight and um, 22. Okay. Number eight, your bedroom, your car, your desk, which would you clean first and why? <laughs> Probably my car. Okay. And why is that? Uh, just because it's, uh, I like to be in a nice clean car. That's all. Simple as that. All right. Number 22. What is a relationship deal breaker for you? Intolerance. Good answer. Very good answer. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. You're awesome, Kenny. And I wish you just the very best. <laughs> you bet. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dan. And happy holidays. You too. Take care, brother. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. And hey, we're not done yet. Next week, it's the Moonbird epilogue episode summarizing the whole year, which is really fun. And then we have a big surprise for our 50th episode. So stay tuned. And in the meantime, if you're still feeling the holiday cheer, please head over to patreon.com forward slash Moonbird and throw a couple last minute bucks our way to help out with the show and if you want even more moonbird in your life and who wouldn't head on over to memories of a moonbird.com or visit me on social media at memories of a moonbird and hey good things are coming in 2021 so hang in there everybody enjoy your families and your friends and stay safe